This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 165 was recorded on May 2nd, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. JDI Research founder Juliet DeClerc returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss everything from equities, inflation, what's going on, and particularly the reasons why Juliet believes that the Fed is going to be unable to service their inflation mandate. Juliet's interview was recorded before Wednesday's FOMC press release, so at the end of Juliet's interview, I'll also have a quick update of bullet points Juliet sent us to supplement her interview with a little bit of context on her opinions about the FOMC outcome. As most of you probably already noticed, we launched Macro Voices Premium this week, and there's a short two-minute launch video linked in your research roundup in which I introduce viewers to the Macro Voices trading desk and television studio. Be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after today's feature interview with Juliet DeClerc when I'll tell you all about our plans to expand the Macro Voices brand, and I assure you it will go on just a wee bit longer than two minutes. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, that S&P 500 has uh, reacted quite negatively to the uh, Powell press conference. What's your thinking here on the S&P 500? Well, first of all, we did hit new all-time highs before that happened this week. So we've been talking about three scenarios for the last couple of months on this program where we either get a failed rally at a lower number and a reversal to the downside. That option is off the table. We have at least hit the double top scenario, and it looked to me like we were on the verge of really breaking out into a melt-up. Needless to say, the FOMC coming out a little bit more hawkish than most people expected through a monkey wrench in the works. But I think that's probably, to use an overused word, a transitory effect, Patrick. I think that eventually what's really going on here is the market was early in anticipating that Powell was going to turn dovish and get accommodative with maybe even a rate cut coming in this meeting. And instead, he kind of went the other way with policy. I think the market has it right that eventually the Fed is reshuffling its deck, getting ready to turn accommodative And I think they're going to have to do that at some point soon. So as long as we stay in this crazy logic where markets go up on accommodative Fed policy, even when underlying fundamentals in the marketplace really suggest they ought to be going the other direction, I think there's room for even further upside in reaction to that easing, which didn't happen at this meeting, but might come at the next meeting. So I think we have to kind of put things on hold and see what happens here. But Patrick, I don't think that the sell-off that we're seeing here in reaction to the FOMC is going to you know, take us down to new below Christmas lows or anything like that. Today's plunge that we saw in the market was probably driven more by rumor of a trade talk breakdown than it was further effect of the FOMC. And even that sell-off that occurred this morning as we're speaking mid-session on Thursday afternoon, we're recording the show a little bit early this week, that's already retraced most of the way. So, you know, I, I think that we're we're, we're getting a dip in reaction to this. It remains to be seen whether we get a melt up to really break out into new all time highs or if we stay in what looks more like a double topping pattern here. But one way or another, Patrick, you know, I think it's the, the higher they climb, the harder they fall. At the end of the day, the recession signs are still there. I, I see no sign of a catalyst that right now is going to cause the final top to be in in the market. But at some point, I think we're going to get back to the zero bound. And that's, you know, the the accommodation. Maybe it helps the market push to one final high. Uh, Eventually, we're going to get stuck in a situation where the Fed runs out of options. And particularly, I think that populism may take some further options away from the Fed. I couldn't be stronger in my conviction that what the market should be doing is going down dramatically from here. But that doesn't mean that it's going to happen anytime soon. Eric, let's move on to the U.S. dollar index, which we spent much of the week kind of backfilling that breakout. But uh, the first response here is some strength in the dollar. What's your thinking here? 
Well, yeah, I mean, we, that pullback was to be expected. We had seen a, a break to a new high and it, very consistent with what you see all the time in technical analysis. You get a breakout, you then take what was a resistance level and you retest it as a support level. And that's what we're seeing. And it looks like we're already headed back up off of that former resistance now acting as support. And I conclude, therefore, that the uptrend is very much intact and perhaps set to really take off from here. Full disclosure, I bought dollar index futures this week uh, on the dip and looks like I, I so far hit the bottom of the dip just about perfectly there are some smart people on the other side of this trade so let's watch carefully and needless to say i'm definitely going to ask juliet about this all right well let's move on to crude oil because i was dying to talk to you about this because it's been a pretty ugly week uh, on the downside of oil what's your thinking here well, I said last week that the uptrend looked tired and exhausted, but I wanted to see a move below the 13-day moving average as confirmation before turning outright bearish. Needless to say, I got that confirmation just hours later. The big news this week, Patrick, was inventory crude oil building another 10 million barrels, 9.9 .9 million barrels, actually. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 265,000 barrels. Gasoline, building 917,000 barrels. Distillates drawing down 1.3 million barrels. Meanwhile, crude oil production in the United States breaking out to another all-time high of 12.3 million barrels, a new all-time record. So, Patrick, all of this comes back to what Art Berman told us on this program several weeks ago when oil was at least $5 higher in price. He said, look, the market is oversupplied. And we got people on Bloomberg and CNBC screaming about fears of undersupply because that's what Russia and Saudi Arabia are telling them to say. But look at the data. Five of the last six weeks were big builds on inventory, well beyond consensus expectations. Meanwhile, Russian production was reported to have broken to a new high, so it looks like they're not really complying with the supposed OPEC cuts. So clearly, I was early, uh, as our regular listeners know, I was way too early in calling the top on this oil market rally, but it seems like maybe finally that top is in. The thing is, how much downside is there really from here? We tested the 200-day moving average just this morning, so that should be good at least for a bounce. It's a very significant technical level. Could be the bottom, but I think there's plenty of room to see even lower prices. It's really going to depend on what the economic numbers and the other news flow tell us. All right, well, let's move on to gold because gold weakened right back down to uh, April lows today. Is this going to keep breaking down in your mind? I think so. You know, gold is doing exactly what I expected it to do, exactly what we've described on this program. There is a strong downward trend line or channel forming. The current top of that channel is around 1300. So that's the resistance level to watch. And it's a steeply declining trend line. I think we're headed lower as long as the dollar continues to head higher. If we don't get a dollar reversal, which some people do think we're about to get, uh, I disagree with them. If we don't get that, I think that there's going to be a continuous continuing headwind for gold. And we've got several key technical levels to, to get through. But I think eventually, if we break through 1180, it could be a quick ride down to much lower numbers around 1000 or so. All right, well, let's uh, move on to the 10 year yield, because it looked like even just yesterday, we were heading back down to those 235 the low levels that we put in in March. But uh, the first response has now pushed us up toward the, the kind of 255 level on the 10 year yield. What's your thinking of the next direction in treasury yields? Well, Patrick, what I said last week on this program is, look, when we tested two spots 60, that was your buy the dip opportunity for bonds. And at that point, we were back down to 251. And I said, you know, it's maybe late to the game. Uh, I think that what happened is it looks like I was right because we continued to see yields move lower after that, which is what I was expecting. I think the Fed has given you this gift of a bump back up to two spot 55 as I look at my chart this afternoon on uh, mid session Thursday. I think that's uh, your last chance maybe to get in on the buy the dip opportunity that you might have missed last week. Charlie McElligot says play the steepener and he's moved his focus from the 5s 30s curve to the 2s 10s curve. He had that out in a note earlier this week. We should get Charlie back on the program Patrick for a full length update sometime soon. All right. Well, this week's featured interview guest is JDI Research founder Juliet DeClerc. Now Eric, why did we invite Julia back this week? <laughs> 
Well, Patrick, Juliet has a fantastic track record across the entire spectrum of macro investing, but foreign exchange and bond rates tend to be some of her strongest topics. Needless to say, that has been the theme this week. So I wanted to get Juliet's take on the dollar. I wanted to get her take on Fed policy and where bond rates are headed. It fits very much in. Now, again, this interview was taped before the FOMC press statement. At the end of this interview, you, I'll read you a list of bullet points that Julia sent us as comments with her reactions to FOMC. Meanwhile, there is a chart deck that accompanies this interview. I strongly encourage you to download it. You can find the link in your research roundup email. If you're not yet subscribed, just go to our homepage at macrovoices.com and look for the red button that says looking for the downloads next to Juliet's picture on the homepage at macrovoices.com. Well, Eric's interview with Juliet is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. JDI Research founder Juliet de Klerk joins me next on the program. Juliet prepared an outstanding chart deck for our listeners, which I strongly encourage you to download. It will be used throughout this interview. You can find the download link in your research roundup email, or if you're not registered yet, just look for the red button on our homepage next to Juliet's picture, which says looking for the downloads. Juliet, it's so great to have you back. It was great seeing you live at Macro Voices Live in Vancouver back in January. You know, something that you had been talking about really all through 2018, you brought up again in Vancouver in January is inflation. And at the time, Juliet, when you started to bring it up, it was very much out of consensus. Now, suddenly, everybody's talking about inflation. So what's up with inflation? What's going on here? Eric, I think you, you're right. Everyone is, is all over inflation today, but um, the real value was to be talking about it last year and to reiterate the same theme earlier this year to forecast basically a risk parity fist, which is currently ongoing. There's nonetheless still value in going through my thinking here to explain the ongoing risk parity explosion. So consider the 2019 supposedly dovish pivot at the Fed. Central banks have allowed financial markets to become a, a byproduct of real rates as long as earnings growth remains positive or basically as long as earnings recession is expected to be shallow. So financial markets effectively have a lower equilibrium rate or R star than the real economy when rates are going down. And of course, the opposite was true in 2018 when financial markets plunged faster than the economy because rates were going up. So that's the simple explanation behind the fact that financial condition loosened dramatically this year, whilst market-based inflation expectations are still very much struggling to recover. In other words, and this was the subject of a, of a late March JDI report, don't be fooled by equity markets. There is no real reflation. This is a theme that the Fed has obviously finally picked up on, with Powell now openly admitting that since officially adopting the 2% target in January 2012, the Fed has not achieved this convincingly or, in fact, in a symmetric way. What I would like to demonstrate here is that the Fed, much like its G3 peers, namely the BOG and the ECB, is already failing its inflation mandate, e.g. it shouldn't be a fear. It should be like a realization that it's already happening. Ahead of the Chicago Inflation Framework Conference on June 4th and 5th, there has been talk about moving from a bygone policy, which basically ignores the fact that the 2% targets may have been missed in previous years, to a makeup policy whereby previous misses would mean targeting a higher target. Personally, I think it's the perfect time to remind our readers and your followers of the fact that moving to a more ambitious inflation policy is delusional when the commitment to the current target and inflation framework is already in question. Inspired by um, Chicago Fed Evans, 
comment on April 15th that a symmetric 2% target should entail running modestly above target 50% of the time, I've illustrated on chart one the Fed's inflation plight on a histogram of year-on-year core PC monthly outcomes since the target was formally adopted in 2012. Not that the explicit notion of inflation targeting appeared in FOMC meetings in the mid-1990s. So if you look on the chart one, you can see in blue a normal distribution with a mean and standard deviation that matches the one of the core PC series since January 2012. And the orange normal distribution has the same standard deviation, but a 2% mean. So it's the distribution of outcomes that should prevail if the Fed was doing its job. The obvious observation here is that the outcome of the Fed's inflation policy framework has been wide of the mark of its stated goal in the past decade, um, about 35 base points. So it's especially concerning, as far as the Fed's credibility is concerned, that pre-global financial crisis, we had a distribution with a 1.72 mean when the target was actually understood to be like 1.5. So in other words, the Fed's inflation performance has slipped away further from 2% since the target was consecrated. So if you believe that the Fed can affect inflation, which is another discussion, well, the suboptimal post-GFC inflation outcomes suggest that monetary policy has been too tight in the aftermath of the crisis. Okay, Juliet. So now that we have established for the math majors that you've made some academically defensible arguments, let's translate some of this to plain English and explain other reasons, if you have some, that might gain conviction on why the Fed is failing in its mission to achieve its inflation objectives. Well, Eric, I'm very convinced that inflation expectations are slipping away. And I'll name and show you a few reasons here. After all, you know, what I like at at GDI Research is for clients to not take my words for for what I'm saying, but being able to actually show it through charts. So let's go through a few charts. Firstly, on chart two, you will see that even with realized inflation recovering since the 2014 energy slump, survey-based expectations are collapsing. And this is a big deal because inflation expectations are normally reflexive, which means that people expect what was delivered in the past two to three years. Even worse on chart three is the fact that low inflation outcomes have become increasingly predictable. And that's ensuring that expectations are not only low, but they are also very well anchored. So you will see on chart three, that uncertainty about the inflation outlook has been trending down in line with increasingly more restrictive Fed accommodation. My view is that in the past decade, the Fed has been too focused on normalization at all costs and the risk of financial stability. And the chart four shows that the Fed has consistently confused brief period of 2% inflation with achieving its end goal. And you will see that on chart four. So it's true that inflation has increasingly been a global phenomenon and constrained by deficient final demand and an overall zero-sum game. But when you're the Fed, low inflation is not a fatality. And I strongly believe that the unduly restrictive Fed stance has cemented the low forever medium-term inflation outlook. In this respect, the 2018 episode was especially detrimental. Powell's Fed was pushing a dot plot of interest rate projection wildly out of whack with the macroeconomic outlook, e.g. falling long-term growth potential and inflation expectations depressed by years of low realized inflation. So it was always going to lead to a forced pause in the hiking cycle. However, achieving a pause that refreshes, which is what many macro pundits are looking for this year, will necessitate a more decisive policy move 
And this is something that is perfectly illustrated on chart five. Okay, Juliet. So if I understand correctly, the Fed is moving toward acknowledging its failure to meet its inflation mandate, but will be prepared to act to achieve the declared objective. Look, Eric, the minutes of the March meeting were unambiguous in highlighting the downside risk to inflation. Meanwhile, so you will see on chart six, the number of FOMC participants seeing upside risk to core PCE has collapsed to a big fat zero. So with core PCE at 155 versus a 2% target and no upside risk to inflation, in a symmetric policy framework, don't you think that immediate action should ensure? I mean, if all FOMC participants saw upside risk to inflation in the vicinity of 2%, I have no doubt that hikes would follow suit. A crucial challenge for the Fed has been the lack of inflation responsiveness to tighter labor conditions and basically no wage spiral. Simply put, it suggests pursuing much more aggressive monetary policy to shift the distribution of core PC outcomes towards the target. In an inflation targeting framework, it suggests scrapping the positive effect of the labor slack component of the Taylor rule when at full employment. And this is a framework that has allowed me to argue in 2018 for a terminal rate just above 2%. Now we have core PC just below 1.6%. My prediction is clearly validated because my modified Taylor rule would dictate that interest rates should be adjusted to like 1.90%, assuming a circa 50 base point real R star. So if the Fed really wants a chance of achieving its 2% target sustainably, it basically has to cut 50 base points. In fact, taking the inflation framework seriously would mean adopting a higher target in line with what Evans was saying, even if it if it's just temporarily, which would actually dictate a reversal of as much of, as three hikes from 2018. Okay, well, if that's the case, what's holding the Fed back? Well, this is the really interesting part of the discussion about inflation. What would happen with the shock interest rate cut? I think what would happen is that term premium would go screaming higher and re-steepen the yield curve. And this is really the problem. Ironically, in its quest to promote financial stability, the Fed has been breeding instability. And this is because sacrosanctify certainty awakens the wildest speculative animal spirits. And this is something you can see on chart eight, where VIX's neck short positioning is basically at all time high. So on chart nine, you will also see a great illustration of how the Fed's faint hearted commitment to a symmetric inflation target has rigged the inflation game and basically cemented a lower for longer inflation outlook, which has allowed long term premium to collapse and given risk assets a very welcome boost in a heavily financialized economy. My worst fear is, and I'm part of the lucky ones because I have savings, that my savings generate no income when I retire. Basically, that rates have collapsed to zero. And my other fear is that those same savings will be depreciated by central banks pumping up the assets I aspire to buy for example, properties. The issue today is that lower rates no longer steepen the curve or raise inflation expectations. So the positive effect of lower rates for purchasing power is completely offset, and in fact more than offset, by higher asset prices from lower for longer yields and therefore much lower affordability. I have been trying to source a mortgage recently and I guarantee you that lower rates are not helping anyone that is not already rich. No bank will lend you money unless you can afford to repay the capital. And this is leading to nothing else than a return to medieval Europe feudalism, which was structuring society around relationships derived from the holding of land in exchange for service and labor. Lords hold the land and vassals pay rent. Anyway, the crazy thing is that as I contemplate the upcoming slowdown, I'm worried about yields collapsing 
asset prices rocketing and becoming a vassal in a medieval system. This leads me to feel comfortable chasing asset prices higher, which is like really crazy ahead of a slowdown. What's happened, basically, is central banks have rigged the inflation game and caused the paradigm shift in asset price dynamic that has now become their main problem. Whilst I'll continue to monitor the health of the global economy and its components like a hawk, the biggest macroeconomic risk today is not an economic downturn that will trigger a financial market crash, but it's a financial crash that would cause an economic downturn. Risk assets have increasingly been priced on the firm conviction that inflation risk were indisputably skewed to deflation. And this has led to the high sensitivity of risk assets to bond yields, which is basically the hallmark of financial repression and asset inflation. And it is today's chief vulnerability. Think about that. Including real estate assets, Global risk assets are worth about five times the size of the global economy. The extreme vulnerability of risk assets valuation to higher term premium make higher yields ultimately self-defeating. And that's the reason why no central bank will successfully reflate and normalize monetary policy in this business cycle. The Fed is the next one to fall. A Fed-induced inflation shock, so for example, a large preemptive cut that would cause term premium to mean revert, would cause bond yields to rise substantially and risk asset valuations to tank. Ahead of the much-awaited June Chicago conference, I warn you, be careful what you wish for, because inflation at this point would more likely become the problem rather than part of the solution. And that's where the Fed is stuck at the moment. It has to play not to lose rather than play to win, it results that it can't win. The specter of inflation when asset valuation depends on low rates is probably one of the reasons why the Fed will choose to turn a blind eye to its evident failure. The failure to reflect the real economy as the desirable side effect of reflating financial assets and keeping what I would call the fake economy afloat. Consequently, much as I expected tighter financial conditions to eventually sound the knell of the 2018 hiking cycle, I expect a break higher in the dollar to collapse inflation expectations and eventually blow the whistle signaling the start of the Fed cutting cycle. In the meantime, the Fed will remain reluctant to cut, ironically, a billion risk assets due to the ongoing disinflation will be a further hurdle to rate cuts. And that means that the Fed will remain behind the curve, reactive rather than proactive, and therefore too restrictive to promote global reflation. Okay, so it sounds like on the whole, your views are very much in line with mine, which is that the Fed has basically painted themselves into a corner. They put themselves in the business of propping up asset markets using money conjured out of thin air. That has successfully changed the subject from the 2008 crisis to asset prices are going up, which took everybody's mind off of our other problems. But it's now put them in a situation where they have no choice but to continue doing things to keep assets propped up. So what's the policy path ahead, given those circumstances? So um, as I expected, Fed officials have started to contemplate inflation thresholds for rate cuts. And that's including a scenario where inflation drifts lower, even without growth faltering. I don't expect the inflation outlook to improve, so we will easily fall towards 1.5% for longer, which Evans defined as is condition for a cut. Honestly, with final demand still subdued globally, and also really in the US, inflation has been the mirror image of commodity and FX move. With the 30% plus rise in the dollar in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, acting as a binding constraint to inflation. We've had a brief dollar sell-off amidst a synchronized global upturn from 2016 to 2018, and it's been a, a main source of reflation via core goods reflation. But it's now actually turned into a deflationary force, as you can see on chart 10. Now, looking uh, towards China, 
whilst we got a powerful stimulus, which has stabilized activity in China, producer price inflation remains muted there. And that means that China will keep being a global deflationary force this year. Going back to the US, productivity growth has more than offset wage growth, which is really keeping a lead on unit labor costs and pushing cost push price pressures down. If you go back to the leading indicators from surveys, and we just got the ISM survey which uh, for which price paid came out at just 50, we're still really looking at a downward pass for prices ahead. Meanwhile, even if energy has been going up so far this year, energy prices remain a deflationary force year on year, and that's visible on chart 14. All in all, I don't believe a rate cut is imminent. However, as inflation softens, real rates move higher and monetary conditions are becoming more restrictive despite the Fed pause. And that's really been the key non-consensus view this year from JDI Research, that this is not a pause that refreshes, but the Fed is already too tight and increasingly restrictive. So that will drive the dollar to continue to appreciate and add further downward pressure on US and global inflation. And the longer the Fed waits, the deeper it will have to cut later. A strong dollar is the one thing that will eventually force the Fed to cut. So I'm looking for a first cut probably in September, which would fit well with June 4 and 5 review of the inflation framework. And that's the reason why I stick to my recommendation to be long dollar versus euro and South African rand. And I also warn against long EM equities. And I also still very much like long fixed income, front end US and Europe as a whole. I also expect gold to outperform as the global FX war will intensify when it becomes apparent that the China bounce will not defeat global deflationary forces this time. I also don't see a Fed inflation big bang as likely, which means that the Fed will not be able to spur reflation. And the result will be an endless inflation-free soft landing, allowing financial assets to continue to re-rate amidst financial repression. So the question, of course, is when does the cycle end? Well, I think it could end with a MMT crazy 2020 US president triumphing over disinflation or basically with the Fed joining its monetary policy peers in running out of potent policy tools after a collapse in the yield curve. Okay, Juliet. So on the U.S. dollar specifically, there is a large consensus among a number of macro pundits that a China-led bounce in global growth combined with a Fed pause could lead to a weaker U.S. dollar. Now, they've also been proven wrong so far, but most of them struggle to understand why. What's your take on this? So um, their prediction really assumes two things, which I think are both wrong. Firstly, as I explained earlier, I think the Fed is still restrictive, which makes the dollar irresistible. And secondly, China-led global reflation is equally questionable, although the missing link in the global reflationary equation really is the weaker dollar. Okay, Julia, what's your take on risk then? So that's my framework. With global central banks traditionally backward looking, they're basically focused on hard data, and that's what data dependency means. Cyclical assets have been surfing on a combination of weak coincident data and strengthening leading indicators. So we've been so far this year in the very sweet spot for risk parity because of data dependent central banks becoming increasingly dovish as profit expectations recover with leading indicators. So that's both positive for bonds and stocks. Now, the weak spot for risk parity and risk assets will return when data starts strengthening meaningfully enough to lead central banks to adopt a less dovish bias and or leading indicator will stop improving. Today, my main concern really is the pickup, is that the pickup in leading indicators is not only kind of fully discounted, 
as you can see for yourself, on chart 15. But it's also quite indecisive, as you can see on chart 16. So on chart 16, you can see IFO and the OECD leading indicators, and they're kind of like my favorite leading indicators. Gross exports in Germany represent about half the economy, which makes the country super vulnerable to oscillations in global growth. And because those exports are closely matched to the structure of the global economy, as far as GDP weight by regions are concerned, the IFO survey, which comprehensively surveys real German businesses rather than you know, experts, is one of my favorite coincident leading gauge on uh, global activity. So last week release showed that much is gentle optimism regarding the rest of 2019 had already evaporated. Not only the current assessment component, which is the coincident data, showed that the German economy continued to lose steam, dragged down by manufacturing and trade, but more importantly, as highlighted on, on the chart 16, expectations also faltered. The truth really is that the Chinese credit impulse, which everybody is looking at to say that global deflationary forces will be defeated, is probably overstated as far as its positive effect on the world is concerned, and especially the non-US world. And there are a few reasons for that. Firstly, because consumption, which is what is uh, favored in China at the moment, instead of infrastructure spending, is much less import-intensive. Secondly, because China's credit impulse is becoming less efficient. If you consider a, a report issued by the IMF last summer, one trillion one of credit was required to generate one trillion of output in 2008. In 2017, which is the last available data, the same output would be achieved with 3.5 trillion won of credit. So in a nutshell, you need a lot more credit to achieve the same output. And even more if you want to achieve the same output, the same effect for the rest of the world, which would be reflected in like imports from China. Thirdly, there is one thing that we're not talking about today is the fact that China's credit impulse for the rest of the world um, is probably going to be a false signal due to the China and US trade deal. So we are at the moment in the last lap of the China-US trade negotiations. And I think negotiators are, are in Beijing this week and they will be reconvening in Washington next week. Whilst the truth is largely seen as positive flow for global trade, and, and it's true that it is as far as uncertainty is concerned, it is really a double-edged sword as far as trade is concerned because the Chinese economy is unlikely to open much further. Therefore, global demand will remain deficient, and the rest of 2019 will be about discovering that global trade is really a zero-sum game from which the U.S. is trying to carve a much larger share. So what I think will happen is that there will be initially a strong crowding out effect affecting Brazil for soybeans and agriculture products, Australia for, for gas, EU and Japan for cars, and EU for airplanes, and Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and again, EU for electronics, which will in the end promote a stronger dollar and eventually just result into a global reshuffling of global trade. So the bottom line is that the trade deal initially come at the expense of other exporters, which means that a leading indicator that has in the past suggested increased global activity may now be a false signal for markets other than the US. In fact, the disproportionately positive effect on the US means that the budding global recovery will be reminiscent of the 2018 dynamic, e.g. unsynchronized. And this will add to already strong appreciation pressures on the dollar and will in turn suppress global liquidity and hinder global reflation. So 
I'm looking for a stronger dollar, lower yields, front-end U.S. and France tenure, for reflation forces to subside and force the Fed to cut. And I also think that optimism about the China stimulus is overdone and increasingly discounted, which has led me to recommend a, a short copper trade last week. I think the positive effect of the China impulse on the U.S. will be countered by a stronger dollar. And for the rest of the world, it's largely becoming a false signal. Juliet, I want to come back to inflation because this is a topic that's very much been on my mind in recent months, although I think I'm looking at it not necessarily differently than you are, but maybe in a different time frame. So let me describe the concerns that I have, and I'd really like to get your feedback because I know that both the social and the economic implications of this are something that I know you think a lot about. Here's how I see things. So many people thought that quantitative easing was going to create runaway inflation. It was going to be hyperinflation, the end of the world, and so forth. And, of course, they simply failed to understand that the way quantitative easing works is that it creates bank reserves. It doesn't pump money into the real economy. It pumps up asset prices, and it certainly has achieved that. And as you said, it's created this tail wags the dog market where effectively it, it's not that the market is, is signaling what's going to happen in the economy. The market is causing what happens to the real economy, which I think is a, a very bad place that we're in. But a bigger trend than that even is I think we've gotten to the point now, and, and Neil Howe writes about this in The Fourth Turning, telling us that what we can expect in periods of history like fourth turnings as we're in right now is society tends to pivot from one extreme to the opposite extreme. And certainly in the United States, regardless of whether you are a supporter of President Trump or you're not a supporter, you, you cannot deny that he is an unconventional leader. He's clearly not the norm. And the potential that I see in the 2020 election is we could pivot to an opposite leadership. Let's say it's Bernie Sanders is president and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is, is vice president. And, and we end up with Stephanie Kelton, the uh, spokeswoman of MMT, as the new Fed chairwoman. In an environment like that, it seems to me, and, and frankly, I, I think we're headed there for a lot of very valid reasons. I think that the people who have been on the wrong side of wealth inequality injustice are rightfully upset. Now, personally, I think capitalism is not the problem. I think it's the cure. I think that if we were to get rid of cronyism and replace it with honest capitalism, that would be the solution. A lot of people don't see it that way. They think we need to move to a lot more social spending. They think we need to move to universal basic income, free college tuition, uh, forgiveness of student debt loans, and various other things. Now, those things they do pump money into the real economy. They would be extremely inflationary. So I think we could be coming into a political change that certainly the populism in your own country of France has shown us that the people of France are just fed up, especially the, the working class, are fed up with economic conditions. They're demanding a change. And I'm afraid the change that we're likely to get is not one that's really going to solve the problem, but it is one that's going to unleash a massive inflation and maybe do more damage with that inflation than the money that was pumped into the economy was intended to do good. What do you think about those concerns? And do you think I'm right that if we were to get to helicopter money at some point, that that's got to be extremely inflationary for the broader economy? That's a great question. So the first part of my answer would be that, you know, we've got the yellow jackets in, in France. But the fact is, you have got like free education in, in France, free health care, and there's absolutely like no inflation. So that's the first element of, of answer on that. In the US itself, I think there's there's very much room for a little bit more socialism without completely departing from capitalism. After all, you know, the US is like the last you know, emerged country not to offer maternity leave for, for women, which is, I think, should be like a sort of a God-given right. So I actually wrote a, a note on that last month, and it was called, Is There a Cost to Socialism? And really, my, uh, my conclusion was that there is a lot of space for more socialism in, in the U.S., as you say, more equality on, on education more equality on, on health care, 
And I really don't think that would be uh, inflationary. In fact, that would be one thing that could probably add some credibility and rebalance like inflation, inflation expectations. I completely agree with you that, you know, I see more and more like uh, even diehard like Trump supporters thinking, you know, you have to be like really rich to really like continue to support the kind of like, uh, you know, running up assets at all costs that is that is currently going on. So I see more and more inequality becoming a problem. And, and I could very much see voters next year going for the other side of the spectrum and, and basically voting for someone that's going to crush them, the, the stock market in a way. And by crush, I don't mean like 50 percent, but, you know, just more uncertainty, higher risk premium and, and et cetera. But yeah, basically my conclusion was that you don't have to get to MMT to just spend more in the U.S., without risking much on the cost side because you'd probably get as long as like rates are are lower than nominal growth you would basically get a lot of benefit from higher spending well we didn't get to mmt in detail in this interview maybe we can bring that up next time i think we've got you scheduled a couple weeks out in our new macro voices premium all-stars format for another short form interview so maybe we can come back to that then Before I let you go for today, though, please give us a quick rundown. You know, when I first met you, you were very exclusively an institutional advisor. You really only offered your advisory services to professional organizations that were primarily hedge funds and other major traders. I like to think that Macro Voices may have helped to make a difference in that. I know that you have opened your services up to some of our high net worth listeners. So give us a sense of what you do there and particularly with emphasis on what you offer to uh, high net worth individuals, family offices, and others that don't meet the traditional profile of an institutional advisory client. Sure. So um, what JDR Research offers really is a, is a unique trade-driven approach to macro research. And what I mean by trade-driven is I really mean everything I write is written for investors and traders in a view to waste as little of their time as possible and giving them the deepest understanding of what's going on and what is likely to happen. I still mostly aim at professionals, but I've made high net worth investors quite happy, I think, in the past two years as well by opening up the product to them. So really what I have to say is get in touch if you'd like to invest in your investment process and learn about macro in the easiest, clearest way whilst making decisive forward steps financially. I don't really believe that real value is ever given for free, apart, of course, uh, on macro voices. So don't contact me for freebies. (laughs) But I'm offering bi-yearly a deep discount to Macro Voices followers for the next two weeks. So do get in touch for this if you're looking for guaranteed real value. What I mean by guaranteed real value is that I'll refund you for up to, to eight weeks if you're disappointed by the product you're getting. And what's the best way for our listeners to contact you, Juliet? Juliet.declerc at jdiresearch.com, or you can visit my website, www.jdiresearch.com, and basically just click on on the link there and, and get straight to me. And listeners, as a little bit of guidance, Juliet's institutional product is in the forty or fifty thousand dollar a year range. It is cheaper for sure for individual high net worth investors, but this is not a few hundred dollars a year. If you're in that ballpark, probably better not to waste your time or Juliet's. But uh, by all means, reach out to Juliet, and uh, again, you can reach her at Juliet dot at J D I Juliet Delta India Research dot com. Juliet, thanks so much for joining us today in the program. I look forward to seeing you in just a couple of weeks on our new Macro Voices All-Stars format. Meanwhile, Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. 
please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Julia back on the show, but that was recorded before the FOMC, and she sent you some notes and comments uh, on the post-FOMC. So what did she let us know? Well, needless to say, in the interview, which was recorded before FOMC, she was skeptical that the uh, FOMC would be as dovish as the market predicted. And needless to say, she was right about that. Here's the bullet list that she sent me, Patrick. First point she makes is transitory is the new autopilot. And she says in parenthesis, we know how long this one lasted. Powell will be proven wrong big time. She then says Powell argued that inflation can fall for many reasons, not all of which call for lower interest rates, and concluded that the latest drop doesn't qualify because it reflects transient technical factors. Juliet says she thinks that if there wasn't a real inflation problem, there would not be a conference happening about it in June. There's no question in Juliet's mind that disinflationary forces are not transient, but Powell is probably working on building a rationale toward cuts. The main problem with his reasoning is that low inflation, whatever the reason is, lowers inflation expectations and contributes to anchor inflation expectations below 2%, which entrenches lowflation. The other problem is that the strong U.S. dollar is not a transient force, so he will be proven wrong, according to Juliet. She goes on and she says that she was not particularly surprised by the lack of urgency, and she expects markets to be the force pushing for a cut via lower break-evens and a stronger U.S. dollar. Powell's Fed will therefore be dragged to reverse some of the 2008 tightening, kicking and screaming. So that's Juliet's post-FOMC update, Patrick. But before we move on and talk about our Macro Voices premium launch, you're going to be speaking at Montreal Options Day. And I know that there is a deadline for people who want to get the early bird ticket to attend that event. Tell us all about it. Well, you know, Eric, actually, I want to spend more time next week talking about what I'll be doing at the show, but it's the Options Education Day that's being held in Montreal. The reason I just wanted to mention is that there's an early bird pricing that's available till May 10th. And so any of our listeners that want to come out and see me talk about options and are in the Montreal vicinity or just want a vacation to Montreal and need a reason for it, make sure you click the link in your research roundup and learn more about it. It's on Saturday, June 1st, and we'll talk about it in next Next week's show. With that said, Eric, let's talk about the premium service. Last weekend, you released a short two minute video, which our listeners can find linked in this week's research roundup or on the homepage of macrovoices.com. And in that video, you announced the launch of Macrovoices Premium. Then on Tuesday morning, we released the first episode of Macro Voices All Stars, a new podcast format which brings our listeners multiple short form interviews every week featuring our favorite Macro Voice personalities such as Dr. Pippa Malmgren, Professor Steve Keen, petroleum geologist Art Berman, Louis Vincent Gav, Julian Brigden, Juliette de Klerk, Luke Roman, Brent Johnson, and Danielle DiMartino Booth. Then, at the end of our Berman's All-Stars interview, you and Art jointly announced that next week we'll be launching Macro Voices Energy Week, an entirely new format weekly podcast that will be all about crude oil and energy markets. That podcast will offer another completely new format where you host the program along with three expert panelists who will be drawn from a rotating panel, including Art Berman, Anas Alhaji, Pat Hemsworth, Joe McMonagall, Tracy Shukart, and Chris Cook. Then, just yesterday, we aired our first Macro Voices Hot Topic interview in which Louis Vincent Gav responds critically to Kyle Bass's investor letter questioning the relevance of Hong Kong going forward in the global financial system. As you explained in the introduction, the hot topic format will be used when we see a need because of a market development to do an interview with a specific guest or guests on a specific subject that suddenly becomes relevant to the market. So let me see if I have this straight here, Eric. 
in the last five days, we've seen a video which you produced in the Macro Voices television studio, which in despite of the fact that nobody, including me, knew that Macro Voices had a TV studio. Then on Tuesday morning, we got the first dose of Macro Voices All-Stars with six killer short form interviews. Then you announced that there will be a new Macro Voices Energy Week podcast launched next week. Then came Louis Vincent Gav's Hot Topics interview on Wednesday. Well, obviously, Eric, there's a lot going on here. Let's start from the most obvious question. What brought all of this about? What's your overall vision of Macro Voices Premium here? Well, Patrick, it all started at our Macro Voices Live event in Toronto when a couple of listeners took me aside at the bar. And basically what they said is, look, Eric, you seem to be stuck in this self-defeating circular behavior pattern where you want to give Macro Voices away for free because you really enjoy making it a free service. We get that. We can see that you love doing this. Eurodollar University and the Dollar Endgame series evidence that. But then the production bills start adding up and the donations that you receive don't fully cover them and you realize how much it's costing you to give this away for free. So you pull back and stop producing extra content. That's very insightful on their part. That's exactly what we did because I'm a businessman and I know it's crazy to keep subsidizing more content out of my own pocket. So the result is that we produce less content than as these guys thought as I would obviously like to produce because I'm obsessed with keeping it completely free. And what they said is, Eric, guess what? We don't want it to be free. We would much rather get more of it, and we're happy to pay for it. Why are you so obsessed about keeping everything completely free? Why don't you charge us for it? We want to pay for it, and we can tell that you want to produce more content than you currently do. Patrick, that was the first time in my business career that I had customers take me aside and give me a talking to because they were upset that I wasn't charging them enough. So their point was well taken. You know, I do enjoy producing this podcast and I'm really proud of the value that we've created and I love doing it for free. But as our longtime listeners know, at one point I got to where I realized I was spending more money producing macro voices and giving it away for free than I was spending on my own primary residence. Now, sponsorship from Big Picture Trading has helped considerably. So my personal out-of-pocket expense is lower now than it was at one point. But the fact remains that I can't possibly justify spending more of my time and money producing content, even as much as I enjoy doing that, and giving it away for free. And the other thing that has inspired me to do this was just being utterly dumbfounded when I realized how strong the Macro Voices brand has become and the loyalty that we've built in our listener base. I mean, let's face it, Patrick, when we did our Toronto event, you and I planned that on a whim, and we both assumed that the audience would be limited to listeners who live in the Toronto area. But to our utter astonishment, more than 75 people flew internationally just to come and attend a one-day Macro Voices live event. Six months later in Vancouver, it was more than 100 people flying in from as far as Sydney, Australia and Cape Town, South Africa. So Patrick, it has been a wonderful surprise for me to realize how much Macro Voices seems to be appreciated by our audience. Okay, so let's talk more about the Macro Voices Premium. The first new content we aired this week was uh, the Macro Voices All-Stars, a new format where there's six short-form interviews, all about 10 minutes in length, all packed together in a single-hour podcast. Now, for anyone who hasn't heard the first show yet, you can find a link for the player in your Research Roundup email or on the homepage of macrovoices.com. Now, Eric, how has the format been received and what can we be expecting in the coming weeks from more all-star interviews? Well, on the whole, I think it went extremely well. We're getting fabulous feedback that people love the idea of being kept up to date on the views of their favorite Macro Voices personalities on a more frequent basis in between their long-form interviews here on the main Macro Voices podcast. But several people suggested that it would be better to package and release each of these all-star interviews as its own separate 10 or 15-minute podcast rather than cramming half a dozen different guests into a single program. So there's a good chance that we'll adjust and package and release these interviews a little bit differently. But the basic concept, I think, is very solid. The other problem we ran into is that first, I very carefully recruited just the right number of all-star guests to be able to rotate them in a way that would deliver five or six short-form all-star interviews every single week. I had everything, all the ducks lined up in a row for that. 
Then I realized the opportunity to create Macro Voices Energy Week. And frankly, that was one of the best ideas I've had in recent memory. But the result is I basically shanghaied half of the cast for Macro Voices All-Stars and reassigned them to a better project. That left us having to take a break from producing more all-star interviews until we reshuffle the deck of participants, so to speak. So there probably won't be any all-stars interviews next week because I stole both the guests and the editing capacity in order to produce Macro Voices Energy Week instead. But just as soon as we can work all the bugs out and get our systems stabilized, I plan to make both Energy Week and all-stars regular fixtures and the weekly premium lineup. Now, since you brought it up, let's talk about Macro Voices Energy Week, which doesn't launch its inaugural episode till next week. But you just described it as one of your best ideas in recent memory. Please elaborate. Well, Patrick, this has been a running joke behind the scenes at Macro Voices, really going back to day one when Nathan Egger and I first launched this podcast more than three years ago. Nate used to chastise me off the air. He'd say, Eric, the show is called Macro Voices, not Crude Oil Voices. Your market wrap has a perfectly appropriate one or two minutes on all the other topics except crude oil, where you would go an hour if I didn't shut you off talking about minutia of the crude oil market that half of our listeners don't even understand. So Nate was right, frankly. The concept at the time was to introduce a macro podcast, and I had a bad habit of just going way too deep on crude oil fundamentals in the market rep because it's a subject I have a lot of passion for. So at that time, Nate was absolutely right and well justified to criticize me for biasing the content of the macro podcast way too far in the direction of my own passion for crude oil fundamentals. Well, Nate, I know you still listen to Macro Voices every week, buddy. So hear this because I'm talking to you. Macro Voices Energy Week is my personal license to go just as deep as I goddamn well want to on oil fundamentals. And I intend to use that license, sir, to create a new podcast completely unlike anything in existence. Macro Voices Energy Week is definitely not going to be about dumbing down oil concepts to the level of the lowest common denominator internet investor. We're going the other direction. We're going to go deep on advanced energy market trading concepts, like what really determines the shape of the forward curves in energy products, why the Brent and WTI term structures often have such different shapes. We're going to get into subjects like tracking the consumption of fracking sand as a statistic to anticipate future production in place of rig count. And we're going to explore much more advanced energy subjects than we generally have time to get into on Macro Voices. But what I'm really excited about, Patrick, is the format. I can explain to you why I think the Brent and WTI curves usually take different shape. In fact, I just did that in the postgame segment after Art Berman's recent feature interview. But there's little value to that because I'm expressing my own personal opinion, and there's nobody else here with equal or better knowledge of crude oil fundamentals to keep me honest and call me out when I'm full of crap. Macro Voices Energy Week will be a completely different format. Every show will feature three industry veteran panelists who will be there for the entire show. They'll disagree with me and with one another, and our listeners will get to hear the story from all sides, including cases where we disagree on what actually drives oil fundamentals, a subject which, frankly, more closely resembles religion than science. We've signed up Art Berman, Anas Alhaji, Pat Hemsworth, Joe McMonigle, Tracy Shukart, and Chris Cook to be our panelists on a rotating basis. Now, for our listeners who may not follow energy markets, these people are all rock stars in the world of energy investing. So I couldn't be more excited about the perspective that they're going to bring to this new show every single week. Okay, Eric. So this new Energy Week podcast, is it something that our listeners who are not professional energy traders should just disregard and would never understand the content you're going to get into? Oh, no, not at all. To be sure, my goal is to create the premier podcast on the internet for professional energy traders. That's definitely one of the main goals, and we do intend to explore topics that are advanced enough that they will appeal to that audience. But just as we found ways to structure Macro Voices itself so that retail investors who are motivated enough to do some homework can learn about much more advanced subjects that we have on this program, which were chosen to appeal to our institutional audience, 
audience. I'm confident we can do the same thing with Macro Voices Energy Week and structure it in a way that will allow all investors with at least a cursory knowledge of energy markets to benefit and learn a whole lot more about energy markets. Now, Louis Vincent Gav was our first Hot Topics format guest. What's planned for future Hot Topics? Well, Patrick, this has been a thorn in my side for years. We routinely come across newsworthy developments in the market that one of our regular guests that we have a relationship would be extremely well qualified to comment on. This week's example was Kyle Bass reigniting the debate over the Hong Kong currency peg. In the past, I used to feel like, oh, wow, you know, that would be such a good Louis Gav topic. But we already have Juliette de Klerk booked for this week, and we only have budget to produce the one podcast episode episode that we already planned in advance. So the whole concept of Macro Voices Hot Topics is to keep a separate budget to produce content on demand when a situation or issue arises that warrants it. In this case, you called me on the phone and said, hey, have you seen Kyle Bass's investor letter? It's getting a lot of circulation on the internet. It seems like everybody's really paying attention to this Hong Kong dollar peg thing. And two hours later, we had Louis booked for an impromptu interview. We never used to be able to do that before, and I'm looking forward to being able to do more of it. We need a budget for that, obviously, and that's why we need to build a premium product. In the video you released last weekend, you alluded to there being even more new content planned for Macro Voices Premium. You hinted that you'd be telling us what it is today. I'm sure our listeners can't wait. So uh, what's on the drawing board? Well, Patrick, a lot of this is still formative, and to be sure, all of it will be listener-driven. We'll continue to solicit feedback on what listeners like the most, and that feedback will play a huge role in determining all of our future programming. Beyond what we've already discussed, there are several more ideas that are still in their infancy. One of them is a monthly show where we take you inside the investment committee, so to speak, where you would be able to listen in on conversations between professional hedge fund portfolio managers and their consultants and advisors talking about trading opportunities that exist in the market. And there are quite a few other ideas on the drawing board. For example, I've envisioned entire series about critically important issues. Now, my favorite topic for that at the moment is modern monetary theory. To my thinking, the question of whether or not MMT is good or bad for society and the economy is one that investors will not have the opportunity to make. That's going to be decided for us by politics. And it's going to be incredibly important for investors to understand when it does and what the implications will be. So I'd like to produce an entire series special series that really goes deep on MMT and what it's going to mean for markets and get the top people on all sides of that debate to participate. And there will never be a shortage, Patrick, of more great ideas that we have and that our listeners suggest for how to create more great content. The challenge is going to come in prioritizing what we actually spend our finite resources producing, and that will be determined by what our listeners value most. Okay, well, let's talk about the video dimension of all this because you didn't announce Macro Voices Premium with a tweet or a podcast. You announced it with a video. What's more, the videos were recorded in the Macro Voices television studio where we were treated to images of you in that amazing studio with seven I, – I think I counted seven mon- – was it seven monitors, Eric, in the background? And he, obviously, you have some serious plans for Macro Voices video on demand. So what's it all about? Well, in that camera framing that was used in the video, Patrick, you could only see seven of the 16 total 4K monitors that comprise the new Macro Voices trading desk and TV studio. So that was just a teaser. Wait till you see more that's coming. But quite frankly, the extent to which we produce video content is an open question. I've invested in building a studio which gives us the optionality that in theory we could do anything we want. But the critical question going forward is going to be what we actually want. Now, it's certainly possible that we could produce most or all of our content as video rather than just podcast audio. But Patrick, the production cost for video can be staggering relative to audio. To give you a sense, professional audio recording studios typically charge fees in the hundreds of dollars per finished hour for podcast content. 
in the video production world, it's not uncommon to see production fees in the thousands of dollars per finished minute of video content. So if we wanted to, we could make everything, including this podcast, full video, where all of our listeners every week see you and I in a TV studio smiling into a camera instead of just talking on audio. The thing is, if we did that, we'd have to figure out how to monetize a much higher cost overhead than we would for just audio. And what's more, the feedback that we've received from many of our listeners has been they want to listen at the gym or while driving, where video would not even be welcomed as an improvement. So for now, the answer is we're going to do some experimentation for long-lasting, high-value content. Let's say we did a new rendition of Eurodollar University. Well, it would be so much better to do that in video because we could make so much better graphs and charts and it would just be a much better interactive format. So for things like that that are high value and are going to be watched over and over again, it makes sense. But if we did video every time we had an idea for a new Hot Topic or All-Stars interview, that would really run up the clock pretty quickly and we would be forced to charge subscribers a much, much higher annual or monthly fee for subscribing to that service. So it's really a question of economics and what our listeners want the most. Okay, well, since you brought up the cost, I'm sure our listeners are already dying to know what the price tag is going to be for subscription to Macro Voices Premium. Obviously, there's a huge amount of new content to offer here, several times more than what we currently deliver with the free weekly podcasts. So uh, what's the price tag going to look like? Well, the short answer is I really honestly have no idea yet. So let me explain. One of the reasons that I decided to just give Macro Voices premium content away for free at first is that I really don't know how much content we can or should produce or what it's ultimately going to cost. The question of how much demand really exists for video is going to dramatically affect the cost of production. So by giving it away for free during an introductory period, it kind of gives me a chance to gauge how much this is going to cost to produce, gauge what the audience wants, what they expect to pay for it, and so forth. And once I get a better idea of those costs, I'll be able to develop a goal for what kind of annual revenue we need and you know start figuring out pricing. But quite frankly, I'm not necessarily convinced that a paid subscription model is even the best way to proceed with Macro Voices Premium. I love the idea of somehow finding a way to keep it free or close to free. And there's a lot to be said for finding a way to monetize the project through advertising sponsorship so that we don't have to charge our audience anything to receive Macro Voices Premium. But Patrick, before you even consider whether it's possible to raise enough money through advertising to support a profitable venture, you have to first ask yourself how much of the audience even wants it to be free. I was very interested by one Twitter interaction that I saw this week where one guy said, hey, you know, I understand you got to make money on this, but how about doing it with advertising so we don't have to pay anything? And then very quickly, another listener chimed in and said, hey, wait a minute, no, I would much rather pay a subscription fee in order to not have to listen to advertising. I want to pay for it. I don't want to listen to the advertising. So figure that our audience includes both people who can afford to pay a subscription fee and would much rather do so in order to continue getting advertising free content. There's also an audience component that would rather tolerate advertising and continue getting free content. I know we have people in the audience on both sides of that debate, so I don't yet have a handle on really how big each group is and what the best trade-off is there. At this point, I'm still gauging how much work it's going to be for me to do this and how much it's going to cost. The one thing that I can tell you with certainty is I cannot continue to subsidize this from my own pocket beyond an initial free trial period where we're going to give away Macro Voices Premium, frankly, just for long enough for me to figure out what really it's going to take to carry this forward. So the plan is definitely going to be to monetize Macro Voices Premium through either subscription fees, advertising, sponsorship, or some combination of those things. At this stage, our plans are still formative, and I don't have any specific price point in mind. Still, another dimension to this is going to be how we bundle and price things. For example, if we do a new Euro Dollar University or some other video series, do we sell that? as a separate product with its own price tag, or do we bundle everything together under a higher annual subscription fee model? I really have no idea. We're not that far along yet. We haven't figured out all the details. 
Okay, so I got it. So what I'm sure, though, everyone's asking and, and maybe accidentally mixing up is the idea of the Macro Voices Premium and our Thursday night podcast, which everyone has grown accustomed to enjoying for free every week. Are we going to be charging a fee to access that podcast too, or is it just the premium content? Well, the short answer is we're going to continue doing everything we can to avoid having to charge you a fee, although it may come to that at some point. I'm committed to keeping the Thursday Night Macro Voices podcast completely free of charge in some form. I'm also committed to continuing to offer that product in a completely commercial-free format for the listeners who really value that commercial-free format. But we can't keep giving away something that costs money to produce completely for free unless we get more sponsorship. So my strongest hope and desire is that we can land a couple of sponsors that might be satisfied just adding a tasteful message at the start and the end of the show saying Macro Voices is made possible by the generous support of so-and-so. If we added a little bit of revenue that way, we could keep the Thursday night podcast completely free indefinitely. So that's my first choice is to find a way that keeps it free. The other option is to keep it free, but monetize it with advertising. And if we have to go that route, I still like the option of creating a separate offer where you can pay a subscription fee in order to bypass the advertising. So at some point, it might come down to a choice where you have to pick between free of charge or free of advertising, because I simply can't continue to give away free content indefinitely when I have to pay for the privilege of creating that content. So we... A couple of sponsors would really help us out. The other idea that's been suggested is to delay the release of the podcast by a week or so so that paying subscribers would get it immediately on Thursday while the content is still fresh, and then it would become free a week later to free subscribers. The rationale there is students could continue to get it for free. They don't care if it's timely because they're not trading it, and the people who do care about it being timely can afford to pay for it. You know, that's a, a viable model, I suppose. I'd much rather find a couple of sponsors so we can just keep it free and simple if we can possibly figure out how to make that happen. Now, at this point, we don't even have the technical infrastructure to charge for premium subscriptions. So you can assume that for the immediate future, nothing is going to change. Something else we've had a lot of requests for is to resurrect our listener discussion forum to allow listeners to discuss the content on Macro Voices with other listeners and with us and even with our featured guests if they choose to participate in those conversations. Now, this was a core part of my original vision for what Macro Voices would be, and I thought it would be really cool to form a community of sophisticated investors where the conversation would begin with each week's feature interview, but then would continue continue in the listener discussion forums online. That general concept was good, and I still believe in it, but two things went wrong. The first was we launched it in the very beginning when the podcast was brand new. We didn't have enough regular listeners, and there wasn't enough of a critical mass to really get a good conversation going. The other really big problem, though, is we were overrun by spammers. For a while, we had volunteer moderators trying to police it, but uh, you know, with a free online forum and the sophistication of today's spam robots, it was a losing battle. So an advantage of a paid subscription model is that we could resurrect a nice, friendly listener discussion forum open only to paying subscribers. That would solve the spam problem, and we could create that global community of sophisticated investors that I originally envisioned when we first launched Macro Voices over three years ago. So maybe at some point what we need is like a sustaining membership that costs less than 100 bucks a year, and it gets you a commercial-free version of the Thursday Night Podcast, plus access to the listener discussion forum, which is only going to be for paying subscribers. The real point here is that there are lots of options to consider. And our goal in navigating all of this, Patrick, is going to be to do the best we possibly can to keep the Thursday podcast free while minimizing the impact to listeners if we have to take on sponsors or advertisers in order to at least make it break even on expenses. Okay, so far we've been discussing your plans for Macro Voices Premium, but a whole bunch of new content that will be given away for free uh, first through the existing Macro Voices feed. So at least during the, the free trial period, our listeners can expect to receive this content automatically. But I remember at the end of our live event in Vancouver, you described your formative plans to launch something you called GAIN. Is that still in your plans? And if so, tell us about it. 
Yes, I still plan to move forward with my plans for gain, but I see Macro Voices Premium as an important first step. So right now I'm mostly focused on launching the new premium content, and once that is set up and running steady state, at that point I'll focus more energy on launching gain, which frankly is much more in line with my own personal passions. As I described briefly to our audience in Vancouver, GAIN stands for Global Accredited Investor Network. Now, the name comes from my own passion for wanting to help people who come into wealth avoid being taken to the cleaners the way I was by some of Wall Street's finest investment bankers and private wealth managers. But frankly, the emphasis on accredited investors comes primarily from my own experience with the private wealth management industry. I know that's who they prey on. But in terms of what I envision GAIN to be, it's really a global network of sophisticated private investors, the kind of people who can listen to macro voices and understand what we're talking about. And more importantly, it's the kind of people who are passionate about learning more. Whether or not they meet the legal definition of accredited investor is not really important to me, and it won't be a requirement for membership in GAIN. What GAIN will be all about, though, is creating a global network of serious, sophisticated private investors who want to collaborate with one another and gain a much more personal level of access to me and to some of our Macro Voices guests. The best way to illustrate what I'm talking about, Patrick, is with an example. So let's pick an investment topic like Australian housing market bubble, which Professor Steve Keen discussed this week in his All-Stars interview. Subscribers to the Thursday night podcast already know we cover topics like that when they come up. If we have a guest scheduled who wants to talk about it, great, we'll talk about it. In the Macro Voices premium level, it's going to be a different story because we're going to be doing hot topics interviews on the subjects that people ask us to cover. So we could certainly include, if listeners want to hear a certain expert talk about Australian housing, we could set that up on demand. At the gain level, it's going to be a completely different story. If we had a gain member express interest in shorting Australian housing, what we do is put out a call to the entire gain network and see who else wants to be involved in that. And all of a sudden, we might be pulling together. Let's say there's a guy in Melbourne, Australia, who is boots on the ground. He owns a dozen properties, and you know he knows what's going on in that market and wants to hedge his exposure. Meanwhile, we have another member who's a banker in London who doesn't have the boots on the ground access to the Australian market, but knows more than the first guy does about bank stocks and how to analyze their balance sheets. Maybe there's another member who used to be a, a short trader for a long short equity fund. And we basically, you know, say, okay, let's get our members who are interested in this. Let's set up some online Skype calls. Let's organize a little task force that's going to look at this trade and share whatever ideas we come up with with the rest of the membership. So it's going to be designed around creating a network of sophisticated investors who want to collaborate and share ideas and investment research with one another. So that's what it's all about, Patrick. And I'm particularly keen to pull family offices into game because a lot of these guys are operating in isolation and they tell me they wish they could interact more with their buy side peers. But all of those pay to play conferences that target family offices are designed to just give them access to the salesmen who have bought the opportunity to speak to them and sell their wares and so forth. So I envision gain is offering in-person conferences where GAIN members can schedule, you know, from a, a block of breakout rooms. We can just set up meetings for topics that are, people are interested in. We can bring in outside experts and do all kinds of cool things. Yet another idea is to do GAIN-only conferences where we would bring speakers in, just like we did for Macro Voices Live, but where everybody would get much more personal access. So we're having meals with the speakers. Maybe it's a conference of 25 people paying a much higher event ticket price as opposed to 250 people where there's only an opportunity to listen to what the guy at the front of the room has to say. So pulling all of this together, Patrick, figure that the existing podcast that everybody knows and loves is going to stay free forever in some form. It might have to be monetized with advertising someday. If that happens, you'll at least have an option to pay a subscription fee and not receive the advertising. We're also looking at resurrecting the listener discussion forum and uh, I'd really love to figure out how to make Macro Voices Premium have a free option. Uh, I don't know if that's possible. I think it's more likely that it will be a subscription service, but we'll see what happens. I certainly want to talk to anyone who's in a position. If you have the opportunity within your organization to become a Macro Voices sponsor, to help us offer some of these new products and reduce the cost to listeners for signing up, please contact me and 
we'd love to do that. Gain is going to have a price tag in the thousands of dollars per year. So to get the most of it, you'd also have to have time to interact and collaborate with other members and so forth. Okay, so I got it. So let's recap. For the moment, the free podcast stays completely free, no charges. The Macro Voices Premium will be offered for free as long as it takes you to figure out exactly what it needs to cost in order to produce the content that the audience desires. And uh, we do have the technology to produce both audio and video content now, and you're going to experiment with both. It also sounds like GAIN is still on the drawing board. Is there any further information available at this time? Well, you know, Macro Voices is a listener-driven program, so I'm very interested in hearing from listeners who might be interested in gain membership. But at this point, frankly, my agenda is not to sell you anything. What I want to do is find out what you want gain to be so that I can refine my concept of it and decide how to organize it and what to offer. So I want everyone to first assume that gain membership is going to cost thousands of dollars per year. This is not an entry-level thing. It's, it's not for the casual investor. It's going to be a much deeper, more personalized level of access to me, to our interview guests, and to other GAIN members. If you would consider GAIN membership based on those parameters, then please contact me. Reach out through info at macrovoices.com. And in particular, what I'd like to hear from you is what you would most like the gain service to offer. I have plenty of ideas of my own, but uh, you know, if there's anything I've learned in business, it's listen to your customers. So if you're a prospective future gain member right now is your opportunity to tell me what you want gain to be so that I can incorporate that into designing the product. And obviously the best way for people to reach you is by emailing info at macrovoices.com. Anything else you want to add? No, Patrick, I think this 10-minute post-game segment has probably gone on long enough for most people's taste. So let's leave it there in the interest of time. Folks, please register your free account at macrovoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our free Research Roundup email every week. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. So this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview. There's also a link to a chart book for Juliet's presentation slides. There's also an article about Ray Dalio saying something like MMT is coming, whether you like it or not, and a link to an interview with Howard Marks. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for our suggestions on how we can make the program even better now, for our listeners that write or blog about the market. Markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. 
The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>